Super Mario Brothers was a fantastic game. Commercially, it was the best-selling game of its time, with over 40 million copies sold on just the NES alone. A smash hit with gamers and reviewers, and it transformed the platformer genre as we knew it. This game defined the term must-have of the generation. Nobody had ever seen anything quite like it. But did you know that the main man himself, Mario, already had an extensive history with Nintendo before Super Mario Bros. first hit shelves? In fact, Mario was such a well-established character that he had already appeared in more than 18 games before hitting it big in the famous Super Mario Bros. platformer. These were awesome games too. But some of these were very obscure, to the point that some of the biggest Mario fans probably don't know these exist. In this video, we're going to jump around the Mario timeline, and I'm going to show you all of the major releases of each game Mario showed up in before he was an international superstar, with the release of Super Mario Bros. on the Famicom and the Nintendo Entertainment System. The first appearance of Mario can be traced back to the arcade game Donkey Kong. It was released in arcades back in July of 1981 as a way to break into the North American video game market. In Donkey Kong, you control Mario as you navigate around a construction site to rescue Mario's girlfriend Pauline from the clutches of the angry Donkey Kong. Originally, Mario was known as Jumpman and his girlfriend was known as Lady. In the original story, Donkey Kong was mistreated by Mario and that's why he's so mad in this game. The game's got four screens in total, with each screen representing 25 meters of the building that Donkey Kong has climbed. Today, we'd probably think of a game with only four screens as being tiny, but this was actually a very impressive release for its time. The first screen is the most iconic of the game. It's a seven-story construction site filled with crooked girders and busted ladders. You've got to make it all the way to the top, avoiding barrels, oil drums, and fireballs. The next screen is a very unfinished structure with elevator platforms and floating girders. You've got to hop around and avoid fireball baddies and bouncing springs. The next screen is a five-story structure that is commonly referred to as the cement factory or pie factory. In this one, you've got to avoid the pies and make your way to the top conveyor belt where Donkey Kong is. Now the final ladders will move up and down, so you've got to time your ascent accordingly. The final level is a showdown with Donkey Kong where you've got to run around a structure avoiding fireball bad guys and removing the rivets so that the whole building will fall and topple Donkey Kong. After you do this, you're reunited with your girlfriend and the game loops over again getting a little more difficult. This game was the first huge success for Nintendo in America, both financially and critically. It was one of the most popular arcade games of all time, creating new franchises for Nintendo, getting its own TV show, breakfast cereal, and several other follow-up games. Just a year after Donkey Kong first hit the arcades, Nintendo developed a portable version of the game. This is the Donkey Kong Vertical Multi-Screen Game & Watch. The Game & Watch series of electronic handheld games were very interesting. In this series, Nintendo would take more risks and try different ideas for their games. They weren't just straight copies of the arcades. There were a lot of fun Game & Watch consoles released. Thankfully, these days we can emulate them in MAME, and very accurately at that. The objective of this game is to jump over the barrels and make your way to the top of the screen and rescue presumably your girlfriend Pauline, just like in the arcade. The biggest difference with this version is that when Mario reaches the top of the screen, you need to pull the lever on the left to make the hook on the crane on the right swing back and forth. Then you need to get over there and jump so that you land and grab onto the hook, which then lifts you up and allows Mario to cut one of the wires holding Donkey Kong up. Then it's pretty much rinse and repeat, and the game loops indefinitely until you lose all three of your lives. The direct sequel to the original Donkey Kong Arcade was Donkey Kong Jr., released the following year in 1982. Here you play as Donkey Kong's son, Donkey Kong Jr., with the goal of rescuing your father, who has been imprisoned by Mario. This is one of the few games where Mario is actually the bad guy. Just like the original game, there are four stages here as well. In the first stage, you've got to climb vines and avoid being bitten by these enemies called Snap Jaws. These guys can travel on both the ground and they can climb around on the vines. The second level introduces a jump board spring that you can bounce on, some floating platforms, and motorized ropes. 
On the top of the stage are some chains that you gotta climb, avoiding these bird enemies called nitpickers, who can crash into or drop eggs on Junior. The third stage is Mario's Hideout. Here, you've got to avoid multiple sets of the sparked enemies by timing your jumps precisely, making your way straight up to the top. In the final stage, you've got to raise all the keys up the chains and into the locks, all while avoiding the snap jaws and nitpickers. Thankfully, the nitpickers don't drop eggs on this stage like they do on the jump board stage, but that doesn't mean it's any easier. In fact, the difficulty of this stage, when you get a few loops into the game, is pretty insane by today's standards. After Junior gets all six of the locks taken care of, the floor disappears and Junior catches Papa while Mario takes a tumble. Mario gets up and then tries whipping the gorillas, but they're not having it. There are several similarities in this game that seem to have actually come over to Super Mario Bros. The grassy platforms look similar, the wavy water looks similar, the bouncy jump board spring looks very similar, and the spark enemies are actually seen again in Super Mario Bros. 2. Just a couple months after the arcade was released, Nintendo also released the first Donkey Kong Jr. Game & Watch. Like the arcade, Mario is the bad guy in this game. The goal in this game is to get past the enemies and make your way to the top of the screen for a chance to grab the key and free your papa Donkey Kong. On the ground, you'll have to deal with snap jaws by timing your jumps to hop over them or even hang on the vines. But while jumping in the air or hanging off a vine, you'll also have to watch out for nitpickers. Once you get to the top of the screen, you'll want to time your jump so that you hit the key at its lowest point. Then you'll unlock the cage, gaining some points, and the game loops over again. The following year in 1983, there were two more portable variations of the Donkey Kong Jr. Game & Watch released by Nintendo. A tabletop version and a more rare panorama version. Both are largely the same game, with the same graphics and gameplay, just in a different form factor. This version is a bit more in-depth with the gameplay. At the beginning, you've got to grab the key and bring it through the stage and all the way to the lock that Donkey Kong is flailing. Along the way, you'll have to avoid several nitpickers and balance yourself on a parasol floating downwards and a balloon floating upwards at the end of the stage. Once you unlock one of Donkey Kong's chains, you have to make your way back to the beginning of the stage to get another key and do it all over again. The game loops after you get all the chains unlocked. Even though there's no snap jaws in this version, in my opinion, it's a much more difficult game than the original Game & Watch version. Donkey Kong 2 was yet another take on Donkey Kong Jr. in handheld form, this one resembling the Mario's hideout stages from the original game. On the bottom screen, you'll have to avoid snap jaws and sparks, making your way to the top of the screen where you'll have to avoid nitpickers and use the keys to unlock the four locks which have Donkey Kong chained up. Sometimes the first key appears on the bottom screen, and sometimes it's on the top. But usually, once you unlock one of the locks, you'll have to make your way all the way back down to get the next key. This is a very difficult game and a very good challenge if you enjoy Donkey Kong games. In mid-1983, Nintendo released Mario Bros. The Arcade. In this game, Mario and Luigi are plumbers, with the task of exterminating creatures that emerge from the sewers. It's a very simple concept. To complete each phase of the game, you've got to flip the enemies on their back by punching the blocks below them. There's also a limited use POW block that can hit all enemies currently touching the ground. Once the enemies are on their backs, you need to run up to them and touch them to kick them off the screen. After defeating all of the enemies, you move on to the next stage, which progressively gets more difficult by introducing new enemies and obstacles such as fireballs and slippery ice. There are several enemies in this game. A turtle named Shell Creeper, crab looking enemies named Sidestepper, which require two hits from below to take out. And they get faster after you hit them the first time. There's also a fly enemy named Fighter Fly, who jumps up and down and requires much more precision to hit, as you can only hit them when they're touching the ground. In this game, you can see some of the fundamentals of Super Mario Brothers. Coins, pipes, turtles. The idea that the brothers themselves being plumbers first came from this game. This game was so important to the development of Super Mario. Absolutely amazing. Many of the ports of Nintendo's arcade games were just simply cut down, rudimentary versions of the original games, which is why I'm not going to bother showing them in this video. 
Though Hudson Soft's take on Mario Brothers was something a bit different, a bit special. Back in the early days, Nintendo and Hudson Soft had a very good relationship, and Nintendo permitted Hudson Soft to acquire license for some of Nintendo's first party games. These were released exclusively for Japanese home computers, such as the NEC PC88 and the Sharp X1. The games developed by Hudson Soft included two Mario Brothers arcade games and a couple years later, a port of Super Mario Brothers. Hudson Soft's first Nintendo release was Mario Brothers Special. This game could be thought of as a sequel to the original arcade version. It features four stages in total, each of which have been completely redesigned from the arcade. The first stage has you jumping between gaps, making your way to the top of the screen to hit five switches, which opens up an exit to the level. After hitting the switches, you have to hurry over to the exits before the switches deactivate and close the exit. The second stage is filled with trampolines, where you have to get on the same one as the enemies and jump on it to flip them over. Then you can kick them off the stage like in the original game. After you kill all of the bad guys, you have to make your way to the platform at the top of the screen to exit the level. The third stage is very tricky. You have to make it up on these conveyors and onto the lift to get up top. Once you're up on top, you can flip over the enemy is just like on the last level. Then you have to collect six dollar signs to make a ring appear up top. You then grab the ring to exit the level. And the last screen is sort of a bonus round. You run around and collect all eight of the dollar signs to make a ring up here. Then you can exit the stage. After this, the game just loops again, this time adding more enemies and progressively getting more difficult. The next Mario game Hudson Soft released was Punchball Mario Brothers. This game was pretty similar to the arcade version, except the level layout has been changed around a bit here, and the enemies don't exit the stages through the sides anymore. Here they drop into this pipe, which is essentially a pit. You don't want to go down in there. The punch ball name comes from the fact that there is now a weapon involved here. The punch ball and the pow are the only way to defeat enemies in this game. You can't hit them from underneath like the original game. As you get further into it, the stage design becomes more difficult, with moving platforms, as well as slippery frozen ones too. The controls aren't the best in this game. There's only a single button to control jumping and throwing the punch ball, which makes this game exceedingly difficult until you get used to that. In early 1983, Nintendo released Mario Brothers, the horizontal multi-screen Game & Watch. The handheld version is a much different game than the arcade game. Here, you've got to control Mario and Luigi, who are working in a bottle factory and need to load up trucks with packages of bottles. On the right side of the screen, you control Mario, who takes the bottles out of the machine and loads them onto a conveyor belt and sends them over to Luigi on the left. You've got to control both characters and intercept the bottles, raising them up and up on the conveyors, until you reach the top of the screen where Luigi will load them onto a truck. This is a very fun game that can get pretty challenging when there are a ton of bottles going back and forth on screen. If you screw up and drop the bottles, the boss will come out and yell at you. If you drop the bottles three times, you'll get fired and the game is over. Fun fact about this one, this is technically the first appearance of Luigi. Nintendo didn't even get this one right. Nintendo claims that the arcade version of Mario Brothers was Luigi's first game, but this game came out before the arcade release, so technically it is the first Luigi game. It's thought that perhaps Nintendo considers the arcade version the first appearance because it was in development before this game and watch. The next game released was Mario's Cement Factory. This had two releases, the original tabletop version and a widescreen version. In Mario's Cement Factory, the goal is to fill the trucks with cement and not let any of it fall and drop. The cement will come out of the two machines at the top of the screen and into one of the top containers. Each container can hold three globs of cement and what you're supposed to do is navigate over to each container and pull the lever to drain it into the container below before it gets too full. You can trip and fall if you misstep on the elevator platform, and what will eventually happen is the cement will come out of the machine so fast it will overwhelm you, and you'll spill some of it onto the truck driver below and lose a life. You only get three lives in this game. The second release of this game was probably a less expensive release, as it doesn't have much color and the sound effects aren't quite as good as a tabletop release. Largely, the gameplay is similar in both releases of this game. It's fun and the gameplay still holds up today in my opinion. 
just when you thought Mario's resume couldn't get any stranger, here we've got Mario's bombs away. In this game, Mario is a soldier who catches a bomb from a fellow soldier on the left and has to deliver it to the soldier on the right. You've got to try your best not to accidentally ignite the bomb. In which case, Mario runs back to the soldier on the left, blowing up both himself and the troop who gave you the bomb. Now the challenge here is that the enemies are hiding in the trees, trying to light Mario's bomb. So you need to move the bomb back and forth, away from the flames, in order to get it all the way to the guy on the right. If the enemies in the trees aren't enough, there's also a fellow soldier who's carelessly puffing away on cigars and tossing them on the ground by you. This means you've got to lift the bomb up and avoid the fire hazard on the ground as well. This game is insane. It really does feel like it's from a different time period. There is no way Nintendo will ever make anything like this again. It's so comically violent and inappropriate by today's Nintendo standards. I love this one. Capitalizing on the success of the arcades, Nintendo released a new Donkey Kong Game & Watch called Donkey Kong Circus. In this game, Donkey Kong balances on a barrel while juggling pineapples. Amongst the pineapples are fireballs, which drip from oil barrels above. You've got to move back and forth, hitting the pineapples with your hands, but you don't want to accidentally burn your hand by catching a fireball. If you get burned or drop a pineapple, you lose one of your three lives, and then Mario jumps up and down pointing and laughing at you. This game was actually an alternative release of a rare Mickey Mouse Game & Watch, which featured the same gameplay, except here the pineapples are batons and the fireballs are flaming batons. When you miss or get hit in this version, instead of Mario laughing at you, you've got Donald, who actually looks very concerned. The final Game & Watch featuring Mario, which came out before Super Mario Bros. anyways, was Donkey Kong Hockey, one of the few two-player Game & Watch titles. In the one-player mode, you use the first controller to play as Mario, who's up against Donkey Kong in a game of hockey. In the center of the stage, you'll see a couple circular-type things called crazy spots. If the puck passes through a crazy spot, it'll increase the speed of the puck and change its direction. This game is well-programmed and has some very interesting features, like how the puck has friction and slows down the further it travels, or how you hit it harder when your shots are well-timed. Even though it's a pretty generic concept, hockey, it still feels well thought out and well executed like most Nintendo products. This Game & Watch is unique as it was released as part of the Micro vs. line of Game & Watches, which saw very few releases. An interesting thing about this one is that it uses external controllers and the console itself can open up and you can store the controllers inside. This game is absolutely incredible. Super Mario Bros. came out in 1985 as a launch title for the North American NES and also came out pretty early in the original Famicom's generation. However, Mario did make some appearances in earlier games released for Famicom and NES before he was a superstar. First, there were the ports of the arcade games Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr., which were launch titles for the Japanese Famicom back in July of 1983, followed by Mario Bros. the arcade port a couple months later. Mario made an appearance in several other games as well. In tennis, he was the referee. In pinball, he was inside of the pinball machine, trapped inside of the bonus area. And in golf, he was supposedly the golfer. In my opinion, this isn't immediately apparent, but Nintendo has confirmed that this is actually Mario. Mario was also in the boxing game Punch-Out. In the NES version, he was the referee, but the NES version came out a couple years after Super Mario Bros. in 1987. The arcade version, however, came out in 1984, and Mario was actually hiding in the background in that game, along with Luigi and Donkey Kong. Over in Japan, they saw a release of an accessory for the Famicom called Family Basic. This released as a keyboard and a cartridge, which allowed you to write your own games and software for the Famicom in the computer language Basic. The computer language BASIC is slow, and the keyboard itself did not see huge success. It did stick around long enough for Nintendo to release three updated versions of the cartridge that powered the keyboard. The third and final revision is what I find most interesting, as this cartridge featured a few built-in minigames, one of which can be translated as Mario World. This game is a very basic platformer. Here you play as Mario, moving him through the stage to collect both the apples and the numbers in chronological order. 
You can climb ladders and jump on these weird springboards that look like equal signs. You have to avoid the enemies and you only get one hit before it's game over. The strange part is that there's no end to this game. Once you collect everything, it just keeps going and there's no goal. I think this game was only developed to sort of spark ideas into your head. Like, oh, you can make games like this. Family Basic does include this Mario sprite built in so that you can use it in your own games. I guess you could say that Mario World came out before the original Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> and finally, we've got Wrecking Crew, which was originally released as an arcade game back in 1984, but saw a release on the NES right alongside of Super Mario as a launch title. Wrecking Crew stars Mario and Luigi, who are part of a demolition crew. The goal of this game is to demolish all of the pieces of the building on every stage. There are walls, brick walls, pillars, ladder walls. You break all this stuff by hitting it with your hammer. There are also bombs placed throughout the stages which can be strategically destroyed to demolish larger sections of the map even quicker. The enemies here are Eggplant Man, Gotcha Wrench, a Fireball which appears if you take too long on a single floor, and the Four Man Spike who, for whatever reason, runs around and tries to sabotage you. This game has very puzzle-like elements to it, where you'll have to think about which part of the screen you're going to destroy first so that you don't accidentally strand yourself with no way to complete the level. Wrecking Crew was the final Mario game released before Mario hit it big as an international superstar with one of the best-selling games of all time, Super Mario Brothers. The game that took the world by storm and forever changed the Mario character into Nintendo's mascot. I hope you enjoyed this look at some of Mario's earliest games. If you did, make sure to leave a like on it to let me know. I do all sorts of cool videos just like this one, so hit that subscribe button and turn on those notifications so you don't miss my future uploads. Thanks so much guys, I'll see you soon in the next video. Goodbye.